UFC star Anthony Lionheart Smith has fought the best fighters around the world, but his bout of the weekend was the most important of his life. Typically when people break in your house is during the day when you're not home. Uh, so at nighttime, usually it's because people want to do something to you. They want to, they want to hurt you, they have something, whether it's a weapon, a gun, a knife, a bat. You know? So I'm, I'm expecting he has something, uh, and I don't. So I just needed to get to him and, 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 and honestly do as much damage as I could before I was going to succumb to whatever he had. Uh, and, and that was my plan. I was just going to do as much as I could uh, and hopefully my family could get out or, or you know, if, if I ended up dying or from a gunshot wound or whatever, that at least he'd be hurt enough that they could deal with it. So that was my mindset going, in, going into that situation. And, I, and fortunately, he, he wasn't armed. Uh, Sunday morning at about 4 a.m., a little after 4 a.m., I guess 4.05, um, my wife woke me up uh, panicked and said, there's somebody in the house. And so I jump up and I hear, uh, I hear a man's voice screaming at the top of his lungs. And he, uh, he's, it's really, he's not really saying anything. It's, it's just that it, it was, it was like from deep within, it was really loud, uh, all the way till he ran out of breath and then he would take a breath and scream again. So I, I ran out, uh, from my bedroom as soon as I turned the corner, uh, standing in, in my computer room. Uh, was a, a strange guy that I've never seen before. Uh, my house was totally dark, and he just, you know, he had this kind of, almost like he was flexing at me, uh, this weird posture, uh, and he was just, you know, walking towards me. Uh, and it was weird to see, like, I surprised him, like I did, uh, which is really odd, but uh, and he just started yelling, and, and that's where kind of pandemonium started. Um, my wife followed me out of the bedroom, uh, and she heard like, I, you know, like she had to go down the hallway to, to get the kids. Um, and I just, you know, I kind of just ran him over, uh, and we started fighting and this whole time, my wife is trying to gather the kids, um, get them to the bedrooms or, or to a bedroom so we can hide them. Uh, and, and it was just, that was kind of where it started. The fight was on and, and, <laughs> with the with the strange guy in my house and where is this exactly in your house is this in your living room uh i have kind of like an open floor plan so okay. uh, it was right in front of uh like my wife's computer and where she does the craft stuff so it's just this odd room that's off of our kitchen okay and so when you uh go downstairs to see this man what happens uh, as soon as i see him you know i, I think i hesitated for just a second because like I don't know what I expected, but as soon as I turned the corner, like kind of because in my bedroom is on the same floor. So he was only 15 or 20 feet max from me when I came out of the bedroom. So 
as soon as I came out, he just looked at me and kind of flexed and, and like, like, it looked like he was trying to scare me and was coming my way. So I paused and kind of thought to myself, like, I don't, I don't, I don't know him. And, you know, and, and then it's just panic. It's like the most terrifying moment of your life. Hmm. And then what happens? Uh, well, I, I didn't know what he had. So I, typically people don't break into your house in the middle of the night uh, for, any, for any good reasons, right? So I'm, I'm expecting that he, I'm going to hear a gunshot or he's going to stab me or I'm going to, you know, like he's got something. So I figure I got about two minutes before whatever he's got takes me out. So I got I figure adrenaline can probably carry you two minutes. What would you... What would be going through your mind if you only had two minutes to live? We live in a culture today that we try so hard not to think about what happens after you die? Lucky that hurt. Dear Anthony, did anyone did anyone tell you since this has happened to you? Or dear strange screaming young man, did anyone say, Anthony, that this sounds really strange that he, one minute he's screaming like a rageaholic and the next minute you said he's so confused and he doesn't know why, it's almost like how did he get here or like he thought it was his own house. It almost sounds like, well, I think you even said at different parts, it seemed like he had multiple personalities. Maybe everything isn't as it seems. Maybe this will make more sense. It's through anything, as long as it's not like a gunshot to the head. So I kind of just tucked my head, took him down, and then just tried to incapacitate him as fast as I could. Uh, and then as the fight's happening, I'm realizing that he's young. You know, he's probably in his, you know, his early 20s. Turns out he's 22 or 23. Uh, it's not very big. It's like 165 or 170 pounds. Uh, but he's super strong. I just was having a really hard time controlling him, uh, just trying to get a hold of his hands and and uh, you know trying to trying to knock him out to get him to stop, and he just never did. Uh, Can you believe this? A professional MMA mixed martial artist cannot knock out this random guy off the street. Much smaller compared to this professional athlete fighter. Please listen carefully to the things he's sharing because I believe that I don't I don't think he even understands what actually happened to both of them that night. Well, it's like okay, like he hasn't shot me, uh, he hasn't stabbed me yet, but he just won't stop fighting. So I'm screaming at him, trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Like I I don't know where he came from. I don't know how he got in, and, and I don't know how long he's been there. Because I'm just waking up to this, but I don't know how long he's been in the house. So I'm, like, trying to get these answers and fight him at the same time. So I'm screaming, you know, my kids are here, my kids are here. It's a lot of cuss words going on, but, you know, essentially my kids are here. Where did you come from? And you know, I think my wife comes during this. She eventually gets the kids hidden in the bedroom. She's on the phone with 911, and she's realizing the point that I'm getting at, like, where's my kids? Because I came straight to him. As soon as I came out of the bedroom, I, me and him went at it right away. And she went to the kids, so I don't even know if the kids are okay. So she's telling me, like, Anthony, the kids are fine. I have the kids. And so now I'm asking him, you know, 
I think the next thing I asked him was, are you alone? So he says, no. And so I say, who's here? And he starts screaming uh, for Luke. He just starts screaming, Luke, Luke. And it's, and it's like, he's screaming for someone to come help him. So then I start really panicking. Like I, I can take one, but it, it's going to be hard to hold to, to subdue two people at the same time. I only got two hands. So, uh, at that point, my wife realizes that like, this is really, really bad. And she blocks the hallway so that no matter who has to, like, no matter what, whoever else is in the house has to go through her first. So, well, my wife's not a fighter, you know, like she's, she's a girly girl, but like that was her, that was there. So my mother-in-law also lives with us, uh, and help, you know, like I travel a lot. She was in school. So like, you know, she's like, helps us yeah, kind of essentially as a nanny. And, uh, my mother-in-law is such a gangster. She, uh, I tell my mother, like, I'm, cause I'm trying to figure out what to do. Like I, there, there's another guy in the house and I only got, I can't take them both. So I tell my mother-in-law, go get me a knife. So she runs, she gets a carving knife out of the, out of the little butcher block. Uh, and she brings it to me and then goes outside to try to wait for the cops because my house is kind of hard to find. So she's going to wave them down. That's her plan. So, you know, I put the knife on him and, and I don't, I don't stab him with it or, or anything like that. But now it, the problem is now I only have one hand controlling him because the other one has a knife. So he starts to kind of get away and I'm losing track of his hands. He's trying to get his hands in his pockets. So I have to put that down to get a control of him again. Oh, and then he starts fighting me. So now we're fist fighting again. And uh, at that point, like now we think there's someone else in the house. So I figure if, if this other guy shows up, then I'm just going to have to, I'm going to have to bury this knife and this kid that I'm on top of and then go deal with this other guy. So fortunately I didn't have to, uh, turns out there wasn't anyone else in the house. Uh, so luckily, but so we continue to fight. I ask him if he has any weapons. He tells me yes. Oh, excuse me. He tells me yes. Uh, turns out he doesn't, luckily, again. But um, he's, it, it, it was, we're fighting the whole time until the cops got here. So it took, from the time the 911 phone call was made, it was just over five minutes for the police to get here. Um, the cops come in. He starts fighting them, too. And then they get me out of, out of the room. Um, and, and my entire computer room is just, you know, it's covered in blood. It's on the blood on the walls. There's, it's a mess, you know, it's a mess. Um, so, and then, you know, the whole police, you know, the crime scene unit comes in, there's 10 cop cars in front of my house and ambulance and fire truck, you know, it's, it's just a disaster. Uh, and, and at the time it kind of, it just, you know, it, they, I think everyone assumed he was just some guy that was on drugs. Um, or, or some guy that, it, it, like, he was confused because he was pretending like he was shocked he wasn't in his own house. So, at the time. Did you hear that? Pick up on this. I seem believable, you know, like, if he's on some crazy drugs, like, n no normal human is able to fight like that, like, uh, I'm by no means the baddest dude on the planet, but he's a regular Joe. And, and I, and I had a hard time dealing with him. Uh, and he, and he took everything that I gave him, you know, like every punch, every knee, every elbow, uh, he, he took every single one of them and never slowed down and kept fighting me. You know, he's doing everything he could to get away. Uh, so go through the whole police thing. Uh, and then the neighbors by this time it's seven, eight in the morning, you know, the neighbors start coming out and they start all checking their cameras and then some of them, you know, some of the other ones start waking up and it turns out my house was the second house that he was inside of. Um, one of my neighbors down the street woke up to him in his bedroom, like, a, a, you know, a, just minutes before he was in my house. Uh, I live in a nice neighborhood. It's quiet. Uh, it's not weird to leave your garage door open or, or to forget to lock your car or, or your back doors unlocked. It's, it's, it's not odd. You know, so, uh, he, he'd gotten into several vehicles and, and gone through them, but not stolen anything. 
Uh, and he got, he was banging on doors, screaming, trying to get into houses. I mean, it was crazy. So there's videos from him coming all the, I mean, nowadays everybody's got a camera or a ring or, or whatever on their houses. So I mean, there's videos from him for about 12 minutes before he got to my house. Uh, and they were continually getting worse. It started with cars, started with screaming. Then he started beating on doors. Then he started trying to get into doors. Then he actually got in the house. Uh, and when he came out of that house, he got ran out of the house. Uh, he actually fled that one. When he was when the guy just yelled at him, like, hey, you know, get the F out of here. And he took off. Uh, went out the back door of that house, came around the front of the house. And, and I believe that's the video that I showed you was him trying to get back in through the front door. So he's getting bolder as he's coming his way down the, as he's coming through the neighborhood. Uh, and, and unfortunately, part of this is my fault. I left the garage door wide open, which is not untypical. I mean, it happens sometimes. Uh, so, he, you know, there's a video of him trying to get into a car. He runs out of, away from that house. It almost runs by my house and stops and looks to his left and realizes that the garage door is open and runs right in. So, you know, it's, it's not always about, like, in hindsight, it, you know, it, I, I obviously wish I would know all that stuff, but at the time, you know, I didn't know where, I didn't know how long he'd been in the house. Uh, it turns out he came in screaming, so he'd only been in the house for 10 seconds before I got to him, um, and nobody knows what he wanted. You know, it, it, the, you know, the police said now today that, you know, he's got a history of violence, uh, some some domestic violence stuff um and, and some history of mental illness so uh nobody knows nobody knows what he wanted uh it, it's this is crazy in the unfolding story of jesus christ this is the first time we encounter a demon possessed person obviously the demon possessed appear again and again and again during the ministry of Jesus and the apostles, even into the book of Acts. It is very significant that the first miracle that Luke records of Jesus is a miracle of delivering a demon-possessed man from that evil spirit living in him. There is a real world of demons. There is a real world of evil spirits, not to be confused with Harry Potter. I read a little bit of uh, Harry Potter, about eight pages, which was enough. I'm not debating whether it's interesting reading, but it's fantasy, and it creates illusions about a nether world, an underworld, a spirit world of wizards and magicians a strange, bizarre kind of creature that has supernatural power. The world of Harry Potter doesn't exist. It is the world of fantasy, but there is a real spiritual world. There really are demons. There really are unclean spirits that possess people. And sometimes I think that all of this fantasy, all of this preoccupation with the world of Harry Potter, and we see it in television, we see it in the movies, the endless fantasies of spiritual beings, supernatural worlds, aliens, is somewhat of a clever smokescreen that covers over the true reality of the underworld of demons. It was no fantasy in which Jesus engaged, however, when He confronted the forces of hell, it was a real world, a real world of demons. The Bible was written to make things clear. God revealed Himself on the pages of Scripture in order that we might know the truth, that we might understand, that we might have what we've been hearing in the music this morning, the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is not a mystical experience. Having the mind of Christ means to think the way Jesus thinks, and that means to think the way things really are, that is, to have a true understanding. It is important that we have a true understanding of God. It is important that we not deviate with regard to God or else we are guilty of 
having a false god. It is important that we not have another Christ than the Christ of the New Testament. It is important that we understand the Trinity and the Holy Spirit the way the Holy Spirit truly is. It is important that we understand salvation the way salvation is because a deviant form of the gospel damns men's souls. Why would we think that we are free to mingle truth with fantasy and error in understanding the dark world of Satan, the world that holds the whole planet captive and in bondage? And when you're talking about Scripture and demons, essentially you're talking about the gospels and the book of Acts. Primarily, there is no incident of a demon-possessed person in the entire Old Testament. There is an explosion of demon possession during the time of Christ and the apostles, and then in the epistles there is no reference to demon possession. Then there will be a greater explosion of demon possession as the apocalypse of Revelation tells us just prior to the return of Jesus Christ when, according to 2 Thessalonians 2, the restrainer is removed and all hell breaks loose as all the demons effect their evil on the world of the Antichrist. Let's look at the text, verse 31. Jesus came down to Capernaum after uh, incensing all of the people in the synagogue at Nazareth. He had to flee for His life. They tried to throw Him off a cliff and kill Him. He goes to a rival city twenty-some miles away called Capernaum, and He there on the following Sabbath probably or soon after that was teaching them. And they were amazed at His teaching. That was always the response. They never heard anybody like this. Clarity of mind, precision of vocabulary, mastery of the language, mastery of thought, power of conviction, all of it was there. They were astounded at His teaching. His message came with authority. And according to the verb in verse 31, He was teaching in the process of teaching when there was a man, verse 33, in the synagogue possessed by the spirit of an unclean demon, and He cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What do we have to do with You, Jesus of Nazareth? Have You come to destroy us? I know who You are, the Holy One of God." And there in the middle of His teaching, having read the Scripture probably from the same text, Isaiah 61, and now explaining to this city that He is the fulfillment of that, He is the Messiah, and that He has come to preach the gospel to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, free those who are downtrodden. What He is saying is that Jesus has now come to go into the kingdom of darkness where sinners are kept in spiritual poverty where they are kept as spiritual prisoners, where they are spiritually blind and spiritually oppressed, and destroy the works of the devil, 1 John 3, 8, and set those prisoners free. In other words, He has come to destroy the kingdom of darkness and to transfer sinners from that kingdom into the kingdom of light. And in the midst of making that declaration and preaching that message, the demon screams out, according to verse... 33 and says in verse 34, ha, what have we to do with you and so forth? Why does Luke start his discussion of the power of Jesus with this miracle? He's very selective for a very obvious reason. All sinners are in Satan's kingdom. All sinners are in Satan's kingdom. They are in the kingdom of darkness. They are dead in trespasses and sin, in whom the God of this world literally works. The whole world, 1 John 5, 19, is in the lap of the evil one. He is the Spirit uh, who works in the children of disobedience, Ephesians 2, 1. He is the God of this world who has blinded their minds, 2 Corinthians 4. He is the one who holds the sinners all their lifetime in bondage, Hebrews 2.14. The whole world is captive to the kingdom of darkness. They are all the children of the devil, John 8.44. And if Jesus came to set the prisoners free, to make the spiritually impoverished rich, to give sight to the spiritually blind, and to deliver those who are downtrodden or oppressed, He's going to have to break the power of Satan and demons over the souls of men. And I do read about regeneration, and I read about conversion, and I read about justification, and I read about redemption, and I read about adoption, but there's one feature of salvation that I rarely ever read about, and it's unfortunate because it's critical, and that is the element of salvation that we would call deliverance. Deliverance. When is the last time you read a book or 
or even an article on the matter of deliverance, that when a person becomes a believer, they are delivered from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son, Colossians 1.13. They are delivered from darkness to light, Acts 26.18. That's what salvation does. It takes us out of the sovereign, dominating power of Satan and puts us under the sovereign, dominating power of Christ. We're no longer slaves to sin. We become the servants of righteousness, to use the language of Romans 6. If we are, if we are prisoners to Satan, prisoners to darkness, if we are in bondage to the devil, if we are in those fortresses of 2 Corinthians 10, locked in those massive granite fortifications of uh, hellish ideologies, and we need to be liberated, if that is our condition, then salvation is our deliverance. And that's why 2 Corinthians 10 says that we come with the gospel and the gospel smashes the fortifications and we rescue the prisoners and lead them captive to Christ. That's what evangelism is. Now, if we are going to be delivered from the power of Satan, which is no small force, if we are going to be delivered from the world of demonic power and influence, then Jesus Christ, who is our Deliverer, must have power over that kingdom, right? Now we already know that He had power over Satan. We saw it at the beginning of chapter 4 because one of His credentials as Messiah was the fact that when He was tempted by Satan, He was totally triumphant. So we know that personally Jesus can resist the power of Satan. What we also need to know is that He can break the power of Satan for the sinner. It's one thing for Him to resist the power of Satan in His holy perfection. It's quite another thing for Him to break the power of Satan over an unholy sinner. That's why Luke starts at this point. If we're going to talk about the power of Jesus, then let's talk about the place where that power has to be in effect. If Jesus came to save sinners, and sinners are subjects of Satan, children of the devil, if they literally are controlled by the spirit of Satan working in them, if they are under demonic control, if they are held in bondage, if they are in great massive fortifications of demonic ideologies where they are prisoners, if Jesus is going to deliver them, if He's going to justify them, if He's going to redeem them, if He's going to regenerate them, if He's going to adopt them, He's also going to have to deliver them. And that's why the Apostle Paul on the Damascus Road was told by the Lord Himself that you're going to go and preach deliverance. James 2.19, the demons believe and what? Shudder or tremble. They're afraid. I'm not afraid of the demons. We have no reason to be afraid of the demons. Greater is He that is in us than he that is in the world, right? There's nothing to fear. I am not the temple of demons. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if they're going to be delivered from the kingdom of darkness while they're being justified and redeemed and regenerated and adopted and converted, all those great concepts, when we're going to be delivered, then Christ has to have the power to shatter darkness, to destroy Satan and his demons. And He does. First John 3, 8, the Son of God appeared for this purpose that He might destroy the works of the devil. And He's done it in my life. Has He done it in yours? He has if He saved you. Satan has nothing in me. He has no authority. Can He condemn me successfully? Not according to Romans 8. He can't condemn me. God hears no accusation against me by the devil. The devil is the accuser of the brother, and God hears no accusation. Why? Because Jesus Christ already paid the penalty for all my sins. No accusation stands. That's why nothing can ever separate us from what? From the love of God. Absolutely nothing. That's why no one can ever condemn us. No one can ever bring a charge against God's elect. I have nothing to fear from Satan. Satan cannot crawl into my life and possess me. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which I have of God. I'm not my own. I'm bought with a price. He paid the price of His blood. He purchased me, took me into His kingdom, filled me with His Holy Spirit, and that's permanent. The question is this simply, if a sinner is under demon power, whether it's influence or the rare kind of possession, can Jesus deliver that sinner? And the answer to the question according to this passage and many others in the Gospels is yes, He can because He did. 
And He did it sovereignly, and He did it immediately. Jesus in His lifetime has numerous encounters with demons. And during the time of Jesus, they kind of blew their cover. They, they moved out of a clandestine and subtle operation with which apparently they're more comfortable. And they were exposed. They, they were exposed in panic and fear very often like this demon. I don't think this demon necessarily wanted to burst out like this, but he involuntarily couldn't restrain himself under the powerful preaching of the gospel, the implications of which was going to be his expulsion if that man believed. And ultimately the implications are that he's going to be cast into the lake of fire. That's why he said, are you here to destroy us? Is this the time? Is it now? Have you come to send us to the lake of fire? All sinners are influenced by Satan to one degree or another. but. Demon possession is a very rare kind of phenomenon, but it was escalated during the time of Jesus Christ as the demons literally were sitting under the powerful preaching of Jesus. The people were all astounded. The people were all amazed. They were astonished. They never heard anybody speak like this. Well, the demons had the same reaction with the added feature that they knew that the powerful preaching of Jesus would not only spell the salvation of those that they possessed. But the power of Jesus would someday damn them into a lake of fire. And so He exposed them, and they escalated the fury of their attack. I think perhaps they uh, may have indwelt more people more frequently trying to hold on to sinners. I told you that the thing I want you to recognize is that demons live in fear. They are constantly terrified. James 2.19, the devils or demons believe and tremble. The question is, what makes demons afraid? And the answer is in this passage unfolding the preaching of the Son of God, the purpose of the Son of God, the purity of the Son of God, and the power of the Son of God. The great power against the demon world was the preaching of the Son of God. Jesus is preaching. He's in the synagogue. He's teaching. He's preaching. And in the middle of His message, this demon who is dwelling in the man in the synagogue screams, the end of verse 33. The demon literally can't restrain himself. This is an un... this is an uh, sort of an unpremeditated, involuntary panic that sets into this demon as he hears the gospel being preached. The gospel that says that the Messiah has come to deliver these sinners from the darkness, the blindness, the spiritual poverty, the oppression in which the world of demons and Satan held them captive. And the demon can't restrain himself, and out comes ha, ah, in the Greek, from the verb saying, let me alone. It's an exclamation of terror. The demon is literally terrified. This is a rare thing. I've, I've preached the gospel for a long time, and only about three times in my whole life have I ever heard demons speak, been confronted. One of them was a few weeks ago, I told you about last week, right down here in the front when a demon-possessed person came running down the aisle after I was preaching gospel, exalting Christ's power over the kingdom of darkness, came at me and said, why are you attacking me? Why are you trying to hurt me? Which is exactly what the demon said here. But it was some years ago. It was a Sunday night, and after the service was over, I was over having some food with somebody from the church, and I got a call from Jerry. He said, you got to come down here, John. I got, a, I got a girl in here who's got all kinds of demon voices. He'd never experienced anything like this, and I never had either. And I said, well, I don't know if I can be much help, but I'll come right down. So I came down, I walked in, and there was chaos in the office. It was uh, over in the uh, building by the, the family center. And I walked in, and the, the place was in disarray, and it was obvious that she had been terrorizing things. She had overturned the desk. And poor Jerry, who was a boxer in the Navy, was having a hard time defending himself against this girl, and th that is characteristic of a New Testament accounts where there's a certain level of strength that's beyond normal. And I'll never forget the greeting when I walked in the door. I walked in the door. And this, out of this girl's mouth, whom I had met and with whom I had spoken because she'd been coming to the church, came this voice, and I, I can't obviously replicate it, but in my memory it was, I know what the voice said, I, it's something like, not him, not him, not him, get him out, get him out, get him out, to me. Well, my first reaction was, I'm leaving. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm up to this. Wow! And my second reaction was, they know who I am. 
and they know whose side I'm on. That's very affirming. <laughs> it was affirming. I sort of started feeling apostolic. <laughs> Paul I know and Jesus I know and John MacArthur, you know. <laughs> wow! Amazing. I don't think that demon was afraid of me humanly. I don't, I don't have any human power to deal with demons. In fact, Jerry and I didn't know what to do. We started trying to send the demons away. We, we sent them everywhere you could think of, the pit, the abyss, Phoenix, anywhere hot, you know. <laughs> and uh, the, bottom, the bottom line is they didn't go anywhere. And so we just were praying and saying, you know, this isn't working. This casting out thing isn't working. I'm not Jesus and we're not apostles and we don't have authority over that kingdom. There's only one way that this girl will ever be delivered, and that is when Christ delivers her in the act of salvation. So we, we wrestled, a, literally physically trying to restrain her and get her in a chair, and she was so exhausted, physically finally calmed down, and um, we gave her the gospel. And she confessed her sin, I'll never forget it, just really gushed out her sin before the Lord and embraced Jesus Christ, and then it was just this calm that came everywhere. There was deliverance. Nothing to do with me, nothing to do with a formula, nothing to do with an exorc exorcism, nothing to do with that at all. That, that is not what deals with demons. She needed to be delivered from the kingdom of darkness. You understand that? She was. She was. The demon was terrified of me not because of something I could do in the human. The demon was terrified of me because the demon connected me with the message of the gospel. And the demon knew that if the gospel came to this girl and she believed it, he was finished. And that's exactly what happened. She was as clean as a driven snow after that, never had another occasion of that kind of terrifying experience. So this demon is in this man, and here's Jesus preaching the gospel. If a demon is afraid of me, whoa! How fearful is he going to be of Jesus? And the demon just screams out, what do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth, which is idiomatic. And I told you last time what that means. Why are you attacking us? Why are you trying to hurt us? Just exactly what that man said to me a few weeks ago. You see, what terrorizes the demons is the preaching of the gospel that sets the prisoners free. You see that? That's what terrifies the demons. When the supremely powerful and absolutely authoritative Word of God is preached, the forces of hell who hear it panic. And never was it preached and never has it been preached the way Jesus preached it. It's no wonder they couldn't constrain themselves. You want some power, then just preach the gospel. That's what delivers people. Let's go back to the man. I mean, the, the, there's nothing about the man. It just says a man. We don't know anything about him and nothing is said about him. We don't know any postscript to the story or how the man dealt with any of this. It just says there was a man in the synagogue possessed by the spirit of an unclean demon. So here's this man, and the demon that's in him, dwelling in him, probably has managed to keep a low profile and ply his work through the man subtly to the effect of the advancement of the kingdom of darkness. All of a sudden, the demon is exposed, and we meet a man who now is a classic illustration of being demon-possessed. It says, possessed by the spirit of an unclean demon. That's comprehensive language, just saying it in a very full way so we know exactly what was going on. This is a man demon-possessed, possessed by a spirit who is an unclean demon. It is possible that a demon could make a person lunatic, as the New Testament word is in the case of one boy who was acting in a deranged way. But when confrontation comes with the demon, there is rational confrontation at that point. That's the way it was that man came rushing down toward me and said, why are you attacking us? Why are you trying to hurt us? Very rational. And the kingdom of darkness was being assaulted by the truth of Christ. So even unbelievers, now mark this, knew when a person was manifesting demon possession. They might not know a person was demon possessed if it wasn't a manifestation. But once there was a manifestation, the, the spiritual pathology was unique to demon possession so that they knew it was demon possession. It was a kind of extreme and bizarre behavior where there was another entity, another personality within that person 
and it was apparent. The only way you will know that the person is demon-possessed is if there is a manifestation, and in that manifestation there will be extreme bizarre behavior and rationality, so that even in the time of Christ, unbelievers knew what was going on. Demon possession, then, is a phenomenon that occurred on an amazing scale during the time of Jesus. The rest of uh, biblical history, it seems to be very rare. And it will escalate again, as I told you, at the end of the age, just before Jesus returns. When He comes and raptures His church, takes the church out, removes the restraint, all hell breaks loose, demons that are now bound in chains in hell are released, they come up to earth, join the ones that are already here, and they wreak havoc during the time of the tribulation, which is described from Revelation 6 to 19, also 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. But it is a rare occasion, and again, we can understand why, because they were exposed. There are demon-possessed people, I think, at all times. They don't always manifest themselves. I think there were even more demon-possessed people during the time of Christ because the demons were moving in trying to hold on to the souls of men who were being influenced by the powerful preaching of Jesus. But mark it now, folks, there's no such thing as a demon-possessed Christian. Salvation is deliverance from that kingdom. There are four uh, New Testament expressions that describe demon possession. You need to know what they are. First, having a demon. That's used sixteen times in the New Testament. It's the most common one, a cone, having a demon. Um, it simply means a person was indwelt and controlled, and one other word, tormented. Indwelt, controlled, tormented. Those are the words. It isn't something that, uh, that, that a person necessarily wanted. Uh, I suppose one could be open to it if one chose, and maybe there are some people who want to be tormented. But the idea of what a demon did came in and controlled, and the person cannot resist the control, and the person is therefore tormented by that control. It is not a form of mental uh, problems. It is not anything physical. It is a supernatural phenomena. And as I said, the, the demons are rational. Uh, they are personal spirits. They talk. They scream. They possess knowledge. They show fear. And true deliverance only occurs when Christ comes again into the life of a person and delivers that person through the power of the gospel. The second phrase, one is having a demon. The second most common expression is demonized. One who was demonized, demonizomai, used 13 times, describes the same thing. A person indwelt by a demon who is exercising control over the person, the person can't resist that control and is therefore tormented by it, tormented mentally, tormented physically. This is not ever used to be demonized or having a demon, is not ever used to, 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 to describe demon influence. I mean, we are all influenced. Satan is the god of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the ruler of the world and all that. He's got the cosmos, the evil system. We all feel his influence. That's different. To be demonized does not mean to be exposed to his influence. It means to literally have a resident demon or demons controlling and tormenting. And that particular phenomenon, oh, the whole world of sinners is under his influence, but that particular phenomenon is much more rare. Uh, demons can influence people. They do. They influence, according to the New Testament, in false doctrine, 1 Timothy 4.1. They influence in immorality, same passage, 1 Timothy 4.1-3. They, Im they influence us in attitudes of jealousy, divisiveness, and pride, James 3.13-16. In other words, the demons have created a world system that sends temptation toward us. But demonized people were not just influenced. They were dominated, they were controlled, and they were tormented. Those are the three words that describe this phenomenon. The demons literally spoke through the vocal cords of the individual, such as Matthew 8, 29, or if wanted to, they kept him from speaking, Matthew 12, 22. The demons um, caused blindness, Matthew 12, 22, gave supernatural physical strength, Mark 5, 3, promoted nakedness. The original streaker was a demon-possessed guy in Mark 5. And it wasn't anything immoral. It wasn't some kind of prurient thing on his part. It wasn't sort of lewd conduct. It was torment. Uh, it, it was embarrassing, it was shameful, it was hideous uh, to be constantly running around naked because you were being tormented and driven to do that by a demon. You also have in the New Testament phrases like entering in, going out, came out, cast out, 
referring to demonized people. So it talks about indwelling, control, and torment, and it was unique to demonization. Here you can see in verse 35, Jesus says, "'Come out of Him,' which indicates that there was indwelling and there was control because the demon had taken the man's voice and used it, and there was torment because the demon threw the man down in the middle although Jesus prevented him from doing any harm to him. So demonization is this kind of indwelling, controlling, tormenting of resident demons who've taken up a place in a person's life. Having a demon being demonized, a third phrase, with an unclean spirit. It's the same thing exactly. You see it here in this text, possessed by the spirit of an unclean demon or an unclean spirit of a demon. It's the same thing referring to the very same phenomena. One other phrase is used in Acts 5.16, afflicted with unclean spirits. And the word afflicted looks at the torment side of it, distressed, disturbed, tormented. So a, a demon-possessed person is in this condition. It is a rare thing. And maybe it is more common than we know, but it manifests itself rarely, generally speaking, perhaps because it is rare, perhaps because the demons want to maintain subtlety and be clandestine because it's more effective. But when it does manifest itself, it shows up in the ways that we see it in the New Testament. It shows up in these forms of torment. It shows up in fear and terror and panic at the preaching of the gospel. Matthew 12, 43. Jesus gives us an illustration of, of demon possession here. Um, he says in verse 43, when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, there's that entering in, going out language which indicates indwelling. When the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, doesn't find it. Then it says, I'll return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it unoccupied, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself. They go in and live there. The last state of that man becomes worse than the first. That is the way it will also be with this evil generation." It's a most interesting statement. Uh, this, is a, this is sort of a metaphor. This is sort of an analogy, sort of a picture. The person who's demon-possessed is like a house. The demon is like an occupant. In verse 43, the unclean spirit who lives in the man decides to leave. He goes out. Maybe he decided it on his own, finding somebody else he could be more effective in. Or maybe there was a, an exorcism. Maybe the Jews got together and they, they uh, pronounced their little formulas and their little incantations and their little chants, and, uh, and maybe the demon decided to leave. That certainly could happen. And it went out. But it pictures that the, this is like a man who leaves his home. And what does he do? He wanders out in the desert. He's roaming around in waterless places. He can't find a place to rest. He thought the grass was greener, but there was no grass and there was no water. And so he says, I better go back. I better go back and I'll go back to my house. Well, he comes back and guess what? Place is unoccupied, swept and put in order. Now, how did that happen? Ah, Jesus could be referring to these Jewish exorcists who went around like the sons of Sceva in Acts and did this kind of thing. It, it, maybe this is a... Um, this is the, the result of that, you know, this person has uh, had the demons called out of him and the demons have obliged and left and said, I don't need to deal with this grief, I'll find another place. And now that they know I'm here, my cover's blown, I'm, I'm not going to be as effective, so I'll leave. So he goes out, tries to find another place, can't find another place that's as commodious and accommodating and, and suits the demon's purposes as well as the man. He goes back and what does he find? The man's cleaned up his act. The house is clean. This even makes it more inviting. What that means is he's gotten more religious. Ah, all the better, right? All the better. The demons would rather occupy a very religious man than a very irreligious man. Is that not true? Because Satan disguises himself as an angel of light and his ministers are disguised as angels of light. So now they go back, they find this guy has had a little moral cleansing, cleaned up his act. This is a legalist. This is a typical self-righteous Jewish legalist. And they say this is even better. And the demon comes back, brings... That's right, he brings seven buddies with him. And now there's eight of them living in the guy. So much for exorcism. So much for formulas and incantations. Jesus said, that's how it is with this, what kind of generation? Evil generation. If you've never dealt with your sin, you're never going to be delivered. You have no control. You might have one demon, you might have a time when the demon's gone, and you might have eight coming back. 
you don't have any control over that. That's the way it is to live in a state of being in the kingdom of darkness under the power of Satan. You are susceptible to that. Again, I don't think demon possession necessarily is connected to being grossly wicked. I think it can be more likely connected to being religious, certainly in the occult, false religion, pagan religion, just a a footnote on that. In all the counts of demon possession in the gospels, all of them in the gospels, no one can be defined, identified specifically as a resident of Jerusalem. There is one occasion of demon possession in Jerusalem, and that's in Acts, I think it's chapter 5. To say that the, that the incidents of demon possession occurred in Galilee, and Galilee was called Galilee of the, do you remember? The Gentiles. Because Galilee was surrounded and crisscrossed by the pagan world. And it seems as though pagan religion provides the best place for demons to find occupation. But that's, we don't want to push that point too far because in the Old Testament you have no occasion of demon possession and you have the whole land of Canaan where they were involved in idolatry beyond description, horrible, horrible uh, acts of idolatry and you don't have demon possession there. And you also have the, the Jew that Jesus is talking about in Matthew 12 who cleans up, his, cleans up his act and gets eight times as much trouble as he got in the first place. But it does seem, I think as a sort of a general thought, that false religion is the door of access very often to, to, uh, to demons. I think we don't want to draw hard and fast laws on that. I think demons may come in to the unbelieving people at any point that they desire to come in. It may not always be easy. This, you, you see this demon in Matthew 12 looking for a place and can't find one. I don't want to make any hard and fast rules. All I'm saying is demons aren't limited to people who are particularly wicked but they are limited to people who are unconverted and they seem more interested in getting involved in people who are in false religion and that fits the picture of Satan as the inventor and purveyor of all false religions. In the light of what we've said, there's a world of unconverted people who are under Satan's influence. Some of them are possessed by demons. It really doesn't matter. Because when the gospel comes, they're all liberated. I asked a question some years ago to somebody who was giving me a whole lot of foolishness about demons, and I said, uh, which is harder, to uh, deliver a person from a demon or um, to get them to believe the gospel? Oh, they said, well, if they've got the demon, you've got to get the demon out of there before they'll believe the gospel. No, it doesn't matter. The gospel is so powerful. It is the power of God unto salvation. Jesus just preached the gospel and the demons reacted in panic. Back to my main outline. This is a four-point outline I've given you. One, I'll give you the rest next week. The first point is what causes demons to fear, to panic? The preaching of what? Of the gospel preaching of the gospel, and the demons panic. Sure, under Jesus they escalated their efforts, but they were not successful. It is also possible that somebody could be demon-possessed by invitation. I think there are people who get into Satanism, who invite Satan, who invite demons, and certainly become possessed. I think you see some of them in the rock music world and places like that. Well, the demon couldn't restrain himself in the synagogue that day in Capernaum. He was tormented by the preaching of the gospel of salvation. That demon shook, that demon shuddered, that demon trembled at the truth and the authority of the preaching of Jesus. And the demon was wanting to hold on to the man, but the demon couldn't do it. He burst out in panic and wanted to know what was going to happen to him. And I think the demons tremble even when the gospel is preached today, don't you? This again is a call for preachers to preach the powerful gospel of Jesus Christ and set all the other stuff aside. Demons don't shudder and panic because of your little incantations, exorcisms and formulas. They don't shudder over your great illustrations and your human manipulations. 
They shudder under the power of the clear preaching of the gospel of deliverance. You like that word? Deliverance, good word. Father, thank You for the fact that Your Word gives light on very dark subjects. We thank You that we have nothing to fear because we have been delivered from the kingdom of darkness. And we have been transferred into the kingdom of Your dear Son. And we are the temple of the Holy Spirit forever. Thank You for this. O oh God, may You save sinners, whether they are under the influence of demons or perhaps even someone who is possessed. May You deliver them. For Your glory and Your honor we pray. No, no, well, not, not anyone in my family. Uh, my kids, fortunately, uh, my wife did such a good job. I was, my family was, my family was so brave. You know, like I've told my oldest daughter her entire life, your only job is to take care of your sisters. Uh, take care of your little sisters. That's your only job. I'll do anything you want. I'll pay. I'll put you through college. Anything you want your entire life. Your job is to take care of your sisters, and that's it. Uh, and I think some of that is just trying to instill that sisterhood in her, you know, so, but she, she took that very serious. Uh, my wife followed me right out. She didn't hide in the bedroom and let me deal with it. She followed me right out, uh, and went straight to, straight to the kids, uh, was able to get the kids all into one bedroom and told them to lock the door and don't let anybody in. And when we finally, so they didn't see anything. They didn't see anything that was going on, but they seen the effects. I mean, they seen it after the blood all over the house and, and stuff like that and the police and but they didn't see anything they didn't see the man they didn't see me and him going at it um fortunately you know he didn't land anything serious on me i don't have any black eyes or, you know whatever so um but you know, you know when my wife opened the door my oldest had the kids tucked like behind the bed in the corner and had both of them behind her and making sure that they weren't going to leave so I, wow. i'm just super proud of them but everyone's safe uh, they're terrified. So, you know, they don't want to, they don't want to sleep in their own rooms. They want to, you know, they all slept in my room last night. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think that that's going to last a little while, but other than that, everyone's safe. It was, I'm sure it was terrifying for them. It's just so loud. You know, he's screaming, I'm screaming. And that's where, that's why my voice is all messed up. You know, I'm screaming at him. My wife is screaming at 911. Um, so, I mean, I mean, a couple of times since then, they've kind of, recited back something that was said during it you know you you think like when you think about this like you hear a story and you try to think of what you would do in that situation but the problem is you're never ready for it like it it's you're never like if you were expecting it like all right tomorrow this guy's coming to my house like you can have a plan but i went to bed i was cooking all night went to bed woke up and that's what i walked right into so I, I, I don't know, like, it, I'm not lying when I said it was one of the toughest fights I've ever had in my whole life. Like, you know, you go, that, that adrenaline happens. And when I went into it, I went into that fight ready to die. Because I, it's, nobody, nobody smart breaks into a house in the middle of the night unarmed. As in, like, if people break into houses to steal stuff, it's during the day when no one's there. They break in at night is to hurt people. And, and that's what I thought. Like, I, I thought that whatever he's got, is, it's going to suck. You know, like, whatever, like, if he sticks me in the stomach with something on my way in, or he shoots me and hits me in the chest, like, I got two minutes to destroy this person to make sure that when I, when I, can, when I succumb from whatever is coming to me, like, whenever, whenever, he, whenever I succumb to whatever he's got, I got about two minutes to deal with him. And, and that's what I did, like... He got everything I had. And then, and then after that point, I realized, like, okay, I'm all right. Uh, but, like, I, I mean, I've, other guys that, are, that do this for a living, I've landed shots on that they're ready for and, and, and put people out. And he just, I don't know. I, you know, Mark Montoya told me that, you know, I was in that, that fight or flight, you know, that fight or flight mindset. And, of course, mine's to fight. Uh, but he was also probably feeling like he was fighting for his life. So I'd imagine coupled with the, 
you know, the crazy stuff that's going on in his head and whatever drugs he may or may not have been on and fighting for his life. You know, like we were in, the, it sounds crazy, it sounds nuts, but that's exactly what it was. It was just two guys fighting for their life and the other guy was giving up. Then, then like the real anger kicked in. Uh, once I was able to, to let go, you know, then it was, cause in the moment you're just, you're just, you're just going, you know, like you're just dealing with this chaos, you know, you're in the fire. And uh, the cops bust in, and, and, and it's just one, you know, like it ended up being like 10, but you know, there's always the first guy. So he came in, it was like the most relieving feeling I've ever had. Like, thank God, like, holy crap, like I made it. Like, because I wasn't sure, you know, like it felt like we were fighting for a lifetime, but it turns out it's like maybe right at six minutes, but like it felt like a lifetime. And I remember thinking, like, half like, dude, like, man, I don't know how long I can do this. He might not last me. Uh, and not to mention, I'm in the training camp. I'm about to fight. So it's not like I'm out of shape. Uh, and he wasn't slowing down. So the cops come, and I was just so relieved. And then immediately followed was just anger. Like, all these questions. Like, what are you, why are you here? Where did you come from? Who the hell are you? You know, and, and, and then, you, again, I don't know all the stuff I know now. So it's like, did he target me? Did like, did somebody send him? Like, and like, who knows? Uh, so then I kind of start freaking out. And so the cops got to take me out of the room. And, and uh, man, I won't, I'll never forget this. They have to walk me by him to get me into another room because uh, I'm freaking out. And he looked up at me with the saddest look on his face. And he's, he's cut. He's cut all over the place. He's bleeding. His face is swollen, covered in blood. Uh and like so calmly, he looked up at me and said, hey, man, I'm sorry. I was like, what in the world? That's it. That's all you have to say. Like, hey, hey, man, I'm sorry. So it was like all these emotions, like the, or all these different personalities he had in such a short amount of time. Like he was terrified at first and then he was angry and then he was mad that I was mad at him. And then he was lost and then he it, but then he was polite. You know, I've grabbed his legs at one point in time and to hold his legs down because he was curling up in a little ball. And uh, for people that don't know this, like someone who curls in a little ball is really hard to control. Uh, so he was tucking his hands in his hoodie or trying to. So she stretched his legs out. And that's when I said, don't, you know, don't effing, don't effing kick, kick my wife. And he just really calmly relaxed for a second and said, OK, I won't. And that was it. He never did. She wow. was like the, the remainder of the minute we were fighting and he still fought me upper body. Uh, but he didn't pull his legs away. He never kicked her. He, like, like in that moment, he was so calm. Well, they took him, the, the ambulance took him to the hospital. Yeah. And, but he walked out of here, which is insane to me. It's but then insane. they took him to the hospital. They took him to the hospital and, and whatever high he was on or, or, you know, whether it's that's a mental high or, or a mental illness high or drugs or whatever. Um, apparently, it started to wear off and he was having some problems. So, you know, of course, there's no one, no one will give you a straight answer. Um, so he's, you know, he's having some some brain swelling problems. Um, and it was some, some it was like his body wasn't regulating his blood pressure, which could be for a bunch of different reasons. Like, I don't, first of all, I don't get this wrong. I, I don't feel bad for him at all. Like I, I feel like he got everything he deserved uh, for what he for what he did. But in general, I feel like we should do a better job keeping tabs on people like that. You know, like because if he didn't come into my house, like if I wasn't here, what does that look like? Because I had a hard time with him. Like, what was my poor wife gonna do? With three daughters, I, I travel a lot, you know, or well, not recently, but in general for, you know, working at shows as, as an analyst, or training camp fights, like there's a lot of times I'm not here. So like, what does that look like then? Because he didn't hesitate to come at me. So like, I, I don't know. Or, or what if it was an elderly couple with two doors down, you know, like those people are in their eighties, <laughs> like what the hell were they going to do? Like, he was going to hurt somebody. So, like, it sucks for me, but better me than anybody else on the street. That's for sure. 
uh, it's weird, man. It's really weird. Uh, you kind of just feel violated, you know, like walking through my garage, like, like, oh yeah. And it's even weirder because we have it on video, not the fight and the stuff inside, but all the events leading up to it, it's very creepy to watch because then you can see him turn and he's walking into my garage and you see my, my, the motion sensor go off and the garage lights up and he doesn't even react to it. Like typically like, you know, like people toms and stuff like they just run off and the light goes on. Like, you know, people stealing stuff out of your garage, the light pops on, they dig off, but he didn't, it's like it never happened. He just walked right through it. No. Uh, so like, you know, I go to the door and it's like, it's just weird. You just feel violated. Uh, and I just, I, I feel, you always just think you're such a, a badass, you know, and it, I just don't feel like one. Like, I feel like, ins- like insufficient a little bit. Like I was, I, I didn't know it was possible to be that, that terrified. But like when I turned and seen him, like, and you have no answers, like you have no idea who he is. You don't know him. You don't know what he's got. But, but you know, like, there's no choice. That's the scary part. Like, you're terrified, but there's no choice. Like, I, it's on me. The only thing standing between him and my wife and three kids is me. So it's like, you got to go. There's no choice. So there's really no real hesitation. I actually see Jeremy Stevens said something in an interview the other day. Like, you know what? You know, I'm ready to fight. If someone broke in your house right now. You wouldn't stretch and get a warm up first, you just go, you know, and that's, that was kind of my mindset was just, I gotta go wreck that body, you know, like, I'm the only, I'm the only thing keeping this family safe, so, I, I, like, last night, I couldn't sleep, you know, you think you're hearing stuff, and, you know, put the rubber gloves on, and then wiped it off the walls, and, you know, and and it sounds, it sounds morbid, like, there's, you know, blood everywhere, it's splattered all over me, and facial cuts bleed really bad, you know, MMA fans get that, you know, it doesn't matter how bad the cut is, they just bleed really bad. So he was cut you know, in a couple spots and uh, he's flailing around. And, you know, so it's, it wasn't like, it, it was just chaotic. It was chaotic. So um, it, it just, it's, you know, it splatters and, he, you know, he's wiping his face and he's flicking it. And, you know, it's just, you know, it's everywhere. But it's, it's all cleaned up and, and nothing's broken. So, and it was pretty centralized. Like from where I initially hit him, like, I'm, I don't even think I, like, punched him on one of our feet. I just think I ran him over. Uh, not 100% sure, but I think that's how it happened. And from where I hit him to where we landed, he, we never moved from that spot. Like, I, I never let him move from where, where we landed on the floor. We never moved from there. So, like, we kept getting stuck under the desk. Like, where he landed was right in front of my wife's desk. And we kept getting stuck under it. So that, that kind of actually closed him in a little bit to where he couldn't wiggle away all the way right or all the way left because he was under the desk. He caught me on the worst possible time, or I guess depends on how you look at it. Like, I live in Nebraska. There's a lot of people own guns in Nebraska. 99.9% of the time, I sleep with a gun next to my bed. 99.9% of the time. And the one time, that's probably the first time I haven't had that gun next to my bed in six months, probably. And it just it wasn't there last night. Or that night. Um, it was in a bag. It was in a bag that I carry. Uh, and then typically I just put the bag next to the bed, take the gun out of the bed, out of the bag, and put it on the uh, on the stand next to my bed. So it, uh, it obviously Nebraska is a concealed carry state. So uh, I just I just left it in the bag. I just didn't think about it, you know. Like I guess you just get comfortable and and in the in the garage door thing was a total accident like i thought my wife was closing it and she thought i was closing it and it was late it was like 1 30 in the morning when i went to bed i was uh smoking a brisket on the traeger and pulled the grill closer to the front door so i didn't have to go all the way up to the driveway to check on it in the middle you know throughout the night so i was i wasn't set to check on it until 6 a.m so it said i mean i'm to walk all the way out there you know i can just run out my underwear open it up in the front door check the pellets you know, do what I got to do and then run back in. Uh, but, and, and so I came out one door and it went in another door. So I didn't close it because I didn't come back in it. it. You know, it's just one of those things you just get caught, you know, like you just get caught slipping. And, and sometimes I guess that's all it takes. No, no, nothing. Nothing like that ever 
happen with my neighbor. But, um, yeah, I can't think of anything. I mean, every once in a while, it's just crazy the stuff you. Th- it's crazy the stuff you think about in the middle of chaos like that. But no, man, nothing. I've never been through anything like that. You know, compared to not doing it. Um, I, I, I've thought about that a lot. It's the what ifs that, that bother me. Like, what if I wasn't here and that was my wife? Again, I love her to death. She's not the toughest person in the world. What if he would have came in quietly? That was a big one for me. He came in and announced himself. Thank God. But so we knew he was in the house right away. But and, and again, at the time, who knows? I maybe been there an hour and started screaming. But now we know he came in and announced himself right away. Anthony Smith, Anthony Smith. And Guy, I don't know your name. What happens after we die? Do demons still exist? Find out. (laughs) Anthony Smith. It's so painfully obvious what happened. And no one's talking about it. No one's talking about it. It's clear. It's clear as crystal. Does, does this look normal to you? Think about it. Is this what we classify? Is this what we classify as mental illness? Maybe we need to, maybe we need to rethink that. Especially with the rates of teen suicide and maybe instead of keeping better tabs on guys like this and people like this, maybe they need Jesus. Because Jesus sets the captives free. And how can how can people like that, how can they ever be free? Just locking them up in a prison or a padded room is not going to solve the problem. And it's sure not going to solve the problem when we tell the world or everyone that Oh, demon possession doesn't even exist anymore. These are the signs of demon possession. Can you handle the truth? This is the truth. Are you listening? One. Those that are demon possessed, some sometimes scripture shows us this, they can have supernatural strength. Does this match up with what Anthony shared? And you know what? A lot of people can mock this or say, oh, demons don't exist. Or what happens if you're an atheist? When you die, that's it. Just like that. But I'm willing to say that Anthony, out of probably the hundreds of times he's been in the ring fighting or, you know, training, demon-possessed individuals can exhibit multiple, seemingly multiple personalities. Did Anthony Smith share this in what happened to him? and his experience with this young man. Yes, he did. Those people who are demon-possessed will often do crazy things that to normal culture will seem way off the wall. Like, for instance, in the scripture, the demon-possessed man was cutting himself. He was living in the caves and the graveyards. He was naked. And why is that? Because demons want to exploit. They want to exploit, cause torment, and humiliate. Because they're just using that person's body as a tent. 
like a little a house to dwell in. And they don't care if they put their muddy coffee or their, they don't care if they put their muddy boots on the coffee table. They and what I mean by that is they don't care if they're going to completely humiliate that person. There was a video, I think, a few years ago on the news, and I don't know if it was in Russia, of a guy on the news who was naked. They had blurred things out. But I think it's like freezing time, winter time, middle of the night, and he's running like 100 miles an hour over a car, almost like it just was like, unreal and he's screaming just like this other young man these things these are people that real people you're seeing that have demons that's why you cannot you cannot subscribe to atheism because it doesn't account for the spiritual and we 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 have a body a mind and we have a spirit but if we open ourselves up to the demonic realm and we can do that through many ways you can do that through um drug addiction alcohol addiction pornography addiction just self-worship people set up shrines to themselves online on you know instagram and facebook Book and they literally worship themselves and there's so many ways people that get involved in the new age you know atheism atheism is a form of idolatry because it's it is it is religion because the god they worship is themselves peace out napoleon bye guys Ralph and I love you. We love you, and we're making this video because we want to see our generation and our peers know the truth and be set free and be able. Yes, sweetie? Yes. Jesus is the truth, the life, the way. No one comes to the Father, but by Him. If you look at this world as it's falling apart, if you truly seek Him, you'll find Him. Okay, I'm just saying goodbye. In my video. Yeah, have any tips? Have any tips for my, my outro? The topic was demon possession. Okay. Um, hello? Yes. Uh-huh. No, I don't believe in demon possession. Mm -mm. Yes. I, what happens after we die? I think we go to stardust. You know, we came from, we came from a rock. Um, please don't push your religion on me. Hello? Good person test? Yeah, I'm a good person.
Thank mm-hmm. you.